I was 13 the first time that I saw two people having a conversation without words. They were deaf and they were signing to each other. And in that moment, I felt a, I have to know how to do that. So I was too young to take a night course. My dad put me in the car, took me to the British Deaf Association, and bought me a doorstop of a BSL dictionary and a little introduction to sign language. And I would sit in the bath, surrounded by bubbles and candles, just throwing shadow conversations with myself against the wall, trying to pick up the basics. Now, flash forward just over a decade, and that initial of fascination had taken me halfway around the world. I started with a degree in sign theatre and deaf studies. I trained for a short time as an interpreter, and then I did an MA in language and communication research. And then in 2007, I joined voluntary services overseas, and I went to Rwanda to work with the Rwandan National Union of the Deaf. And we traveled around the country, researching and compiling the first dictionary of standardized Rwandan sign language. Now, many people don't realize, but sign language is not universal. Each country has got its own sign language, and within that you find regional variations and dialects. So, for example, if you come from a city, you might drink. If you come from a village, you might drink. In the UK, we have spiders. And in Rwanda, we have spiders. <laughs> So, this is a picture from 2009, when the dictionary was first published. And it went on to inform interpreters on the news and teachers in schools. So, it's a project that I was really proud and very privileged to have been a part of. And which, in absolutely no way whatsoever, influenced my career today as a piano tuner. So... <laughs> Pianos are quite difficult to find in Rwanda. There aren't many of them. But a very kind Egyptian expat was going home, and he agreed to sell me his. But when I sat down to teach myself to play, I realized that some of the keys didn't quite work, and it was very out of tune. And as difficult as it is to find a piano in Rwanda, it is almost impossible to find somebody to come and fix one. So, enter YouTube. I sat myself down. And within about 24 hours, I have managed to fix the keys. They just need a little bit of glue. Within a week, I had learned to tune it. Within a month, I was tuning other people's pianos. And within four months, I no longer had a piano because it was in pieces on the floor. So what happened there was, <laughs> from the moment that I first took the front off the piano, and I saw how beautiful it was and how intricate, and I just felt that exact same that I had felt at 13. And I knew that I had to know everything about how a piano worked. And then one day, my friend Desiree came over. Now, Desiree is a carpenter in Kigali, and he was delivering some furniture. And as he came in, the piano was in the corner, it was open, you could see the strings, you could see the hammers. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and we just knew that we had to try to make one. So this is a picture from last year when we cast the first string frame in Rwanda with the help of Chillington, who are a metal foundry in Kigali. And this next one is from last week when I'd almost finished stringing it. So we're still not too sure if it's working yet, but we're hopeful. <laughs> and so really, a lot of very interesting things have happened in my life, or started in my life, that began with a click. But what am I here to convince you of today? Well, I don't think that formal education has kept step with the way that we learn. And that is not to say that formal education isn't important or useful. I owe a lot to my degrees. But at the same time, I do think that it is limited. And one issue that I have is this, which was taken from a study last year. And what it illustrates is that many people have an overriding belief that informal, self-directed learning 
is not as important or as valid or as strong as formal institutionalized education. Now, I strongly disagree with this. In fact, I'm a great example. You know, I managed to teach myself to tune a piano in a matter of days. Formal education attempted to teach me mathematics for 11 years. <laughs> And to me, five times seven still equals tomato. That one is not going to happen. And I don't think that it is that I'm incapable of learning it, but emotionally, I feel completely disengaged with the topic. And I found the same with my nephew. So my nephew's 15, he's going on 16, he's getting ready to do his uh, exams. And when I caught up with him and I asked, you know, how's it going? Are you feeling confident? Are you feeling kind of, you know, it's going well, and he sort of looked at me and he went, yeah, it's going all right, he said. It's not going great, except for the three topics that he got to choose. So he's actually doing really well at photography, computer science, and graphic design, because those are the things he's really interested in. And at the end of the day, that's really what all learning boils down to. How interested are you? How much of a do you get when you first encounter a topic? And there's a whole field around this called the science of interest. And what it tends to suggest is that if you start to learn something at the moment you are interested in it, then not only do you learn it much faster, you tend to learn it in more depth and more detail, and you have a much greater chance of retaining that information afterwards. So the flip side of that is, if somebody's talking at you about something you are not interested in, then you'll probably learn it more slowly, if at all, you might just skim over the surface of the topic, and you'll probably forget a lot of it again afterwards. Now, for me, having seen both sides of the coin, I tend to feel that formal education is very good at teaching you about what you might need to know in the future. Once you leave the learning environment, you go back to your office or to begin your career. But the wonderful thing about self-directed learning, and especially online learning, is that it's right there in the moment that your interest is peaked. You have a problem, you can solve it, a question, you can answer it right there and then. And yet, it's still looked down upon as being something less than formal institutional education. And I kind of understand why. According to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the average British undergraduate leaves university in debt to the tune of £50,000, having given up three years of their life for the privilege. So to have somebody come along and say, oh yes, relational data management, I just learned how to do that on YouTube, you know, I get it, I really do. <laughs> but then it becomes very tempting to talk about the quality of education in terms of how much money you spent, and how many years you relinquished. But when we talk about self-directed learning, we're not just talking about hobbies and pastimes. We're talking about some truly life-evolving skills. So this is Jessica. Now, Jessica has always been an artist, but one day she came across Henna on YouTube, and she realized the potential for body art. And so she started a business. That's now her income. She built something from that. This is my friend Henry. Now, <laughs> Henry had the idea of building solar-powered mobile phone charging stations that you can take right out into the rural areas of Africa so that even people who do not have electricity in their homes can still charge their mobile phones. Now, he learned everything about the process of product design from online forums and websites. And today, his company charges over a 1,000 phones a day in Rwanda and Burundi. And this is my friend Nikki. Now, Nikki did not live independently for the first time until she was 40. And when she first started to live by herself, she felt a bit embarrassed about going to her closest friends and relatives and admitting all the things she wasn't too sure how to do for herself. But she got around that with online communities and YouTube tutorials, which she credits for teaching her everything, from how to fix her dishwasher through to how to cook a balanced meal. Now, we feel safe doing that 
in the comfort of our own homes. When we think about school, classrooms can be very competitive environments. Offices can be very competitive environments. You're constantly being watched, you're being judged, you have to live up to expectation, you mustn't disappoint. And in that kind of an atmosphere, you can't mess up. And if you don't mess up, you don't get better at anything, as a friend online recently illustrated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> there's another really important element to this. So, <laughs> my mother could have retired at 60. She didn't, she loved her job, so she carried on, but she could have done. Now, when I checked my pension forecast the other day, I am not eligible to retire on a state pension until I am 68. Now, that is a big difference. And you know, I've, I've always been somebody who is uh, fairly aware of mortality. <laughs> and not to get too depressing about it, but life is short but it can feel extremely long if you are stuck doing something that you do not enjoy. People do not stick to the same careers for life. The job market changes almost as quickly as people's interests change. And I would suggest that it is completely unsustainable for the job market, for the economy, and for mental health to expect people to part with thousands of pounds and years of their life every time they want to retrain. We're living in a world where we should not only expect but encourage people to change course through life, explore new ideas, start new businesses, see where that goes. But in order to do that, we have to free up the most precious commodity of all, time. So imagine if we had a universal basic income so that people were not afraid of losing their homes, of not making rent, of not being able to feed themselves or their children. Because when you get dragged down into that daily grind, you don't have time to dream. You don't have time to imagine. You don't have time to have those moments of inspiration and see where that goes. And it is precisely those random moments of inspiration that propel us forward as a species. So, I'd suggest, let's let go of this compulsion to categorize people by the job that they currently do, and valuing education by how much you paid for it. And instead, let's make it much easier for people to validate the knowledge and the skills that they have independently gained so that they can start to change the future with it. Thank you.